Coming up, the health service is creaking at the seams. Is AI the answer or part of the problem? Hi everyone, Neil Patterson here with the Sky News Daily and this time we're talking artificial intelligence, also known as AI, two letters that seem to inspire and terrify in equal measure. But there are three letters that could benefit hugely from advances in the tech, NHS. No one, least of all the health secretary himself, would deny that the health service is in a state understaffed, arguably underfunded, and with huge ingrained systemic problems. Now, add to that an ageing population and an ever-expanding set of chronic complaints plaguing the public, and you can see why reports of a crisis in the NHS are anything but hyperbole. So, anything that can assist in reducing the burden on the healthcare frontline, including AI, will be greatly welcomed by the bean counters. Whether or not the patients are ready for it, well, that's another matter. But like it or lump it, artificial intelligence is here to stay, with Donald Trump's visit being used to announce billions of pounds of investment in UK AI by some of the biggest US tech companies. Thomas Moore is, of course, our science and medical correspondent. Thomas, you've been looking at some pretty innovative tech that apparently can predict a patient's risk of disease years before it presents. I mean, what, what have you found? It sounds pretty interesting. Yeah, and, and that's really exciting mm. because a lot of diseases that we have uh, these days actually start perhaps a decade or two earlier. That There might be signs there in our bodies that we're not aware of because they're not symptomatic, but there's something in our blood or elsewhere that if, if you could spot it, you get that early warning. And that's essentially what these researchers at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory have been doing. They're based in Cambridge. And what they did, they, they used this AI tool called Delphi. They looked at people who've signed up to the UK uh, Biobank. That's a research database. They looked mm -hmm. at, uh, they've got a lot of health records on there. And they basically scanned these health records and, they, and then just looked to see what the progression was over over time and bingo they then develop anything up to a thousand different diseases. They essentially sent the AI to medical school. Yeah, in a be in a sense, yes. AI is, is a very good tool at, at sifting data to, to pick up the things that are really important. Against all that noise, what do we need to focus on? AI is not smart. Mm. It, it, is, it is, in effect, uh, statistical. What is the most likely event that will follow if you have certain things in your medical history? Then over time, that progression leads to a diagnosis of a disease. So, so, so how many patient records has this, this AI been able to, to get its way through? So they trained it on 400,000 mm -hmm. and then they unleashed it on 1.9 million people wow. in the Danish patient registry. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how they kind of validated it. And they found that it was very good at, at picking up uh, the signs that do lead to these 1,000 different diseases. Now, what, what conditions are we talking about? Well, we're talking about everything from heart disease, stroke, wow. uh, and that kind of thing. It's not so good at predicting things like in, infectious disease, where they're kind of almost outside of our control. Mm -hmm. uh, also, things like mental illness, where there are just too many variables for it to understand environmental factors. But heart disease and so on has its beginnings in things that are going wrong in, in our cells or things that are being laid down like calcium deposits in our arteries. Now, if you can pick up those signs so early, you might start lifestyle interventions or even medical treatment that could stop it developing or certainly slow it down. How do we think patients, though, are going to react to this, to being told that, you know what, if you carry on the way you're going, five years, ten years' time, you could have X, Y or Z. Look, I think this is going to be a challenge for everybody. Mm. Doctors need to understand the the benefits but also the pitfalls of using this kind of technology. But patients need to understand it too. There is a risk that you might get people who are fatalistic. Mm. What's the point, you know? <laughs> the doctor says I'm gonna gonna develop heart disease in, in double down years. double down on the burger. Hundred percent. There's no incentive to give up the fags, they might say. Mm. But then there are other people who might say that they're becoming overly concerned, that they might become paranoid uh, about their, their future health. And I think the 
there needs to be some psychological assessment before you start rolling out these tools for clinical use? Because the tool that I've been talking about, this Delphi tool, at the moment it's being for, used for, for research purposes. Mm. Then they think that it might help public health people kind of anticipate what the health needs of our population would be in the future. And only when they're satisfied that it's ready to be rolled out into the doctor's surgery, and that might be five or even ten years, that's when they would do it. No discussion of kind of new tech going into the health service or into healthcare in general uh, can, can avoid the cost discussion. 100%. And I think this is going to make it a lot more efficient. So at the moment, for example, when you're looking at CT scans, x-rays, mm. that kind of stuff, you need two doctors to, to eyeball the scan to verify what the other has seen, to give it the all clear or to confirm that there is something that needs to be investigated. Now, if you could have an AI assistant mm. that is doing that first first take, flagging ones which it thinks need much more urgent attention, that is going to make it a lot more streamlined and, and help an overwhelmed radiology service to cope with the demand. At the moment, we don't have enough radiologists. AI could certainly help. But I wonder, from your conversations with the many, many people you know working in frontline healthcare, how do doctors, how do nurses feel about the advent of AI? You have to bear in mind that these are people operating in a world of, of chronic staff shortage. So if there is some way that AI can help them manage the mundane, it could improve the quality of care. But there's another really important factor that I think we cannot ignore from AI. There is all kinds of bias in the health service that leads to health inequality. And that's partly because Doctors may have grown up a, a long time ago or been trained a long time ago when the population was very different from today. Uh, and that has ingrained guidelines and risk factors and things they look out for. And, and we know that, for example, black women are uh, four times more likely to die in childbirth than white yeah. women because they present in a different way. The risk factors may be different. Now, if you can train AI to, to spot very specific presentations of symptoms in all kinds of uh, demographic groups, that could improve care and close that inequality gap. Thomas, stay where you are, because I want to just turn now to, to another example of AI potentially uh, helping out within the health service. Uh, Dr. Ben Marithapu is the founder and CEO of the health tech company Sera, formerly an innovation advisor uh, to NHS England. Um, ben, just, just remind us, what exactly does Sera do? So we focus on taking healthcare from hospital to home using technology. Um, so patients at a click of a button can get a carer or nurse um, or other healthcare professional to look after them in their own home, which is more convenient for them allows us to potentially spot health issues early and address them, and it's also much more affordable for the health system. We launched a handful of years ago, and we're now delivering around 2.5 million patient home visits every month across the country, largely on behalf of the NHS and local councils. Um, and like many other companies, you yourselves are, are dipping a toe into these AI waters. Absolutely. So we have been developing AI at Sarah for a number of years now, and a key tool that we built takes the information that our carers and nurses log when they deliver a visit to someone's home and they log that information on our app. Um, items such as someone's symptoms, their medications, what they're eating, drinking, their mood. And our AI uses that to predict the risk of someone becoming unwell before they do. And we can do that with around 80% accuracy. This in turn allows us to take action earlier on. And overall, we've seen this cut hospitalizations by over half in many cases. To date, our model has now saved the NHS and government over a billion pounds. And we're saving the NHS and government around one and a half million pounds every day. We're hoping that this is a positive example of what technology and AI can do to help improve public services. And one of many more to come as other health tech companies, but also technology companies affecting other sectors, get more scale and become even more transformative because of AI. You mentioned that the app has an accuracy of 80%, and no doubt that will improve as the data set expands. But I'm not sure I would necessarily pop along to a GP that told me he got it wrong one in five. Ultimately, all of the assessments and changes to care that we make, and those decisions are made by our care and operational teams. This is a tool that assists them in making those decisions in better, smarter ways and gives them more of a heads up. Overall, our tools here on the side of caution. 
So they have a very low threshold for flagging a risk that someone may be unwell in the coming days. And then it's ultimately up to our carers and nurses and our operational teams to make a decision as to how they want to proceed. So your vision, at least around this particular area of AI and healthcare, is that this is a tool that is used by humans, not a tool that replaces humans? Exactly. For example, now if you're driving from A to B in your car, you may use Google Maps to give you guidance as to which route is the most efficient, where there's been a traffic jam or an accident, and if you need to take a different route. You're making the decisions, you're in the driving seat, but that technology is helping you. And in the same way, our technology helps our frontline staff every day to deliver better care, but they are ultimately the ones making the decisions along with our operational and quality teams. You have you know, advised the NHS in England, at least on, on innovation in the past. So you, so you will have a view, I'm sure, on whether or not this is an organisation that can cope with rapid shifts in technology and practice. I mean, in your experience, how good is the NHS at incorporating new tech, like your AI tool, into you know what are decades-long established working practices? What I'd say is, for example, in the pandemic a few years ago now, the NHS had to adapt very quickly, both in terms of adopting new technologies, changing ways of working, coping with greater demands, and also rolling out the vaccination program. And it was able to do that all pretty quickly. We need to learn from some of those experiences and see how else we can roll out technologies, tools, and innovations quickly to benefit patients, given the huge pressures that the system is under, both massive waiting lists, more and more people turning up and requiring treatment in A&E, but also cost pressures with the NHS as well. Technology can be, and I think needs to be, part of the answer. And so I think we need to pull together and try and adopt and roll out technology quickly at scale. And in the past, sometimes the NHS hasn't got that right. But sometimes when it's put its mind to it and it has been prioritised, it has got it right. And we need to reflect on those examples and use that when it comes to AI, adopting it in safe, effective ways to provide better care while saving money. Let's just go back to, to Thomas Moore. I mean, Thomas, Ben was making the point there that, that sometimes the health service has not necessarily been, in inverted commas, an early adopter of new ways of doing things. You were mentioning before we spoke to him about the fact that sometimes, you know, there are, there are healthcare professionals who have been in the job for decades and find it difficult to change the way that they work. I mean, this is an almighty change. Well, even now, the NHS is the biggest purchaser, the biggest user of fax machines, can you believe? What? Fax machines? Yeah, because they don't... Uh, some people are, are resistant to electronic transfer of, of data, so mm. it, it remains a fact that the NHS is still using fax machines and, and the kind of stuff that most people abandoned two decades ago. So that is the kind of challenge that you're up against to try and get this new technology out there. But there are big champions now. Once you begin to see the, the efficiencies mm. that AI can bring, how it can help with staff shortages, help with patient demand, then I think that is going to be a big incentive to roll this technology out. But isn't, isn't the biggest problem with you know, rolling out this new technology across the whole of the health service yeah. that there isn't just one health service? No. In the form of trust, we've got lots of little mini ones. Yeah, the National Health Service, mm. in many ways, a, a misnomer. Because we, we've known with, with electronic patient records, records. Uh, hospitals go their own way. They buy in software from different companies and suddenly we find that the software mm. doesn't talk to other software. It is a nonsense. So mm. we need to get on top of this. So if we are going to roll out these AI tools, there needs to be some consistency and make sure that, for example, if you're using an AI tool to look at an x-ray, mm -hmm. you need to make sure that there aren't subtle differences in how different tools look at x-rays so that there is some consistency in the result. I just worry that the general public, when they hear about AI being used in diagnostics or, or wherever within the health service, start thinking about robot doctors, mm. you know, a faceless algorithm making decisions about your health care. And I don't think that inspires a huge amount of confidence. There definitely is the view that this needs to be seen as a, a doctor's assistant, that this mm. is a tool that doctors use, that there is still human oversight. This is not going to be unleashed on the population and that there are no human eyes on your care. This is just the start, though, isn't it, of AI in healthcare? I mean, where do you see this, uh, th th this technology ultimately taking us? 
Well, I think it's moving so quickly. I don't think you can predict. Mm. You would never have seen that this would move quite so fast. I think it will be instrumental in reducing hospital visits, identifying people who are most likely to be going to hospital. It will help shift this move to preventative care. AstraZeneca, for example, the, the pharmaceutical giant, it's looking at biosignatures in your blood. So 3,000 proteins in your blood, are they the first record of anywhere in your body that you're going down the track that will end up in disease perhaps even 20 years later? That would be a game changer mm. if you can pick up disease that early because then perhaps you don't need medical in intervention. We talk a lot about the cost of drugs, but if you can make changes that early, it could be much cheaper uh, and you might not need that lifelong care that might follow with a chronic disease. You mentioned you know, your big pharma there. I mean, you know, very recently we have seen investment that was destined for this country by big pharmaceutical companies being removed. There is a massive investment coming from our, our cousins across the Atlantic in terms of AI. But, but I just wonder how long that investment might stay here, whether or not this is a country that big pharmaceutical companies, big artificial intelligence companies see as a long-term base. This is a real danger. Innovation does need investment. Mm. If you're going to have a first pick on, on those innovative treatments, then they need to attract um, the, the right people here. The big attraction for countries to come to the UK is actually the National Health Service and the very good uh, patient records we have on millions of people. And that's why, for example, you had Eli Lilly coming over here to try and do a trial mm. with, with Munjaro, their weight loss drug, and Wes Streeting's quite interested in how that might help get people back to work, productivity and that kind of stuff. It's that kind of innovation. We have a good clinical trial set up here because of the excellence of the NHS. Thanks, Thomas. You can read more about AI in the NHS on the website, the Daily's back tomorrow. Until then, you take care.